And so on that note, we will hear the reading of scripture from the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the apostles. Read this morning by Joe Smith. Acts 1, 1 through 14. Dear Theophilus, in my first book, I, Luke, told you about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he ascended to heaven, after giving his chosen apostles further instructions from the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. On these occasions, he talked to them about the kingdom of God. In one of these meetings, as he was eating a meal with them, he told them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you what he promised. Remember, I told you about this before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, are you going to free Israel now and restore our kingdom? The Father set those dates, he replied, and they are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It was not long after he said this that he was taken up into the sky while they were watching, and he disappeared into a cloud. As they were straining their eyes to see him, two white-robed men suddenly stood there among them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven, and someday, just as you saw him go, he will return. The apostles were at the Mount of Olives when this happened. So they walked the half mile back to Jerusalem. Then they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here is the list of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together continually for prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Well, as you heard me tell the children, today is Ascension Sunday the day when we celebrate the return of the risen Christ to his Father in heaven. But I'm not so sure that the disciples were celebrating. After all, they were getting used to Jesus being around them again, never quite sure when he would appear or disappear. They at least had the assurance that he was still physically part of their lives. Although, as I tried to explain to the children, his body looked quite different after his death and resurrection. In our scripture this morning, Jesus has appeared to them once again. In response to his promise of the Holy Spirit not many days from now, the disciples ask the $64,000 question, Lord, Is this the time that you will establish your kingdom here in Israel? It's a natural question in that the disciples would link the coming of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the promised messianic age where God would reign. But Jesus says, in effect, you are looking for the wrong things. My Father and your Father in heaven have no intention of revealing when such an event will occur. That is not what you're to focus on. 
But I can tell you this. In a short time, God intends to do a mighty act. God the Father will send his own spirit, the Holy Spirit, to you to live inside each one of you and all who believe that I am the Son of God. Because God's Spirit will live in you in the interim, in the in-between time of today and the ultimate coming of the kingdom of God, you will have much to accomplish. You will find yourself doing greater things than I. You will tell others what you have seen and heard from me, not only here in Jerusalem, but in all of Judea, north and Samaria, and to the ends of the then known world. The disciples didn't know it, but these were the last words to them. For suddenly as they watched, The risen Christ was literally taken up to the sky and disappeared in a cloud. Dumbstruck, the disciples looked for him in vain to where they'd last seen him. So intent were they that they did not notice two men in white robes, angelic beings, standing literally beside them. That is, until they started to speak. Talk about going from one startling event to another. Perhaps they were questioning their sanity. First disappears, Jesus disappears into the clouds, and then these two angelic beings come out of nowhere. But think about this. This is not the first time that the followers of Jesus have been looking for Jesus and have an encounter with angels who are questioning them. Remember, you may remember Mary Magdalene and the other woman who early on that Easter morn were peering inside the tomb expecting to anoint the body of their very crucified and dead Rabbi Jesus of Nazareth. But his body's not there. Instead, they encounter what? Angels, right? Angels sitting where the body of Jesus was lying. And they ask a question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? In other words, why are you looking for Jesus in all the wrong places? Well, now, in the past 40 days since his death and resurrection, Jesus has come upon them at will and left them just as abruptly. So now on this hill in Galilee, they are together with Jesus in what we might call for them a new normal. Jesus is definitely not the same. Other mortals were brought back to life by Jesus during their three years, and it was their bodies that were restored to life. Jesus, on the other hand, now inhabits something quite different from the body that was laid to rest in the tomb. His has become a resurrected body, tangible. It will never die again. And yet it is much more. But this risen Christ is still very much the man they have known and loved for three years. He's still teaching them. He's still preparing them, giving them the next steps in this walk that they have been called to. But these disciples are very much their old selves And they're obsessed with how to get rid of these Roman legionnaires who are occupying their country. And then the new normal gets another twist. Jesus doesn't just disappear this time like they've gotten used to. Oh, no. The disciples are allowed to see him rising and then disappearing in a cloud. First we have angels at the empty tomb. Now we have angels on a hilltop. 
but without Jesus. Empty tomb, empty hillside. You getting the connection here? Uh huh. And both sets of questions that the angels have asked speak to us as well. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And why are you looking up at an empty sky? You are looking for Jesus in all the wrong places. Jesus is no longer there. This Jesus who has been taken up from among you to heaven will in God's perfect timing come again as certainly and mysteriously as he left. So what does that mean for all the souls over the centuries who have said, ah, the world is going to end on blah, 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 blah. Do you remember the Mayan calendar which ended on December 12th, 12, 12, 2012, and the world was going to come to an end? Well, what year is it now? Come on, you know what year you're living in. 2015. Thank you. So it didn't happen, did it? Only God the Father knows the time and place. So don't believe anybody else's hoo-ha and get all upset. As I read this passage from the first chapter of the book of Acts, I was reminded of a country western song. You may remember it as well. I was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces, hoping to find a friend or a lover, the one I'm dreaming of. This song was so popular because it's about us. We're often looking for love, for meaning, for purpose, for life in all the wrong places, aren't we? On one Emmaus weekend, I was serving as a spiritual director. And on a Saturday afternoon, there's a break between the various talks and the men or women, depending upon which weekend, and this was a women's weekend, Um, you're allowed to get out and stretch your legs and kind of start to process all the wonderful things that you have heard during the past day and a half. And I was taking a walk with a gal named Joni. She was vivacious, intelligent. She was a mental health counselor. And she told me earlier that she was very new to this Christian faith. And she was not sure to how to integrate what she believed and life in the church, or whether she even thought it was necessary to be in church at all. Now, you've heard me say a bajillion times why we need to come together, right? Because coming together helps us grow in faith. Without growing in faith, it shrivels and turns into something useless. When we come together in small groups, we learn and we grow and we pray and we challenge one another. God developed the church because he knew we needed one another. We need to learn how to pray for one another, forgive one another, right? Because as you've also heard me say many times, pobody is nerfect, right? So you have to learn to forgive and get along because we're all different and wonderfully unique. And ultimately, if we don't come to church, we forget who God is and whose we are in the sacrifice of Jesus. So during my stroll with Joni, she explained that over the years she had been involved in the occult, tarot cards, astrology. She had explored many of the world's religions. She did feel that Jesus was, in her words, an evolved being. But then so was Buddha, Gandhi. To her, an evolved being meant that someone who was extraordinarily wise and good, who had evolved above the pettiness of life. 
She was comfortable talking about God, but very uncomfortable talking about Jesus as the Son of God, as someone not only human, but divine. Then she said something very revealing. All my life, I have been looking for life. All my life, I have been looking for life. At this point, we're walking on a small peninsula that sticks out into the Manatee River. And there is a tall, maybe 15 foot tall, rough wooden cross in the ground. I said, Joni, you have been looking for true life in these many, many places, and each area may have contained something of truth except for the occult, tarot cards, astrology, because God's word is very specific to stay away from such things. But Jesus promises us that he is the way, the truth, the life, the clear path to God the Father, life abundant and eternal, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And when you look at who Jesus truly is, you will find that he is the answer for all you've been searching for in your search for life. And then you won't keep finding yourself bouncing from one thing to another to another. How exhausting. Joanne then said this. I want to want this, but I sense my resistance. So I told her about a wonderful prayer. A prayer that asks God to give us the desire to want to know the fullness of God. The desire to want to know the fullness of God. And so I said, look, we're standing right here by this cross. Why don't we lay our hands on the base and pray that God will give you the desire to see him more clearly? So we did. Then it was time to wander on back. Later on that evening, on the Saturday night, in Emmaus, there's a time in the chapel just before bed. It's a time to consider all they've been hearing and experiencing of God's love over the last 48 hours. It's a time to open themselves up to this incredible act of God's love in the form of Jesus the Christ. Often, a lot of tears, a lot of Kleenex used up that night. For some, it, they've come to the realization that they may have had, oh, lots of head knowledge, and they're very proud of head knowledge in the Bible, but no heart knowledge. No heart knowledge of this divine lover of their souls. And many experiencing for the first time Jesus' great love and sacrifice for them. And for others, their initial love had grown cold. And they'd gone looking for unconditional love, that agape love that only God can give, in all the wrong places. Maybe in their spouses. Our spouses can't give us everything, dear art. In their families or friends in their jobs or even sadder in promiscuous sex adulterous affairs in drugs or too much alcohol or in big houses expensive cars or buying stuff for the sake of stuff all that to fill this aching hole that only God can truly fill with God's self God created the hole that we might seek after him and find the satisfaction that only God can give in our lives. And so on that Saturday evening, many recommit their lives to this lover of their souls. And for Joni and another gal, it was the night they chose to give their hearts to Jesus. 
to end their dead end merry go round search for life to begin to live out this new life in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it would be for the disciples of Jesus 2,000 years ago. They too would stop looking for him in the heavens and in empty tombs, and they would go obediently back to Jerusalem, awaiting the promised coming of God's Holy Spirit the Spirit of God that would empower them and us this morning to go and tell our stories of looking for Jesus in all the wrong places for true love and finding it in Jesus Christ. So where are you in this story? Are you still looking for love? for life in all the wrong places? Or maybe your love has gotten cold and you just need to ask the Holy Spirit to warm you up again and get you back in next to his heart. So I invite you all this morning to come and yield your heart, your life, that like Joni and so many others over the centuries might discover what true life is all about. All about the crucified, resurrected, and now ascended Christ Jesus who sits at the right hand of God the Father. And as that wonderful country song sort of ends, I'll bless the day I discovered you, Lord, while looking for love. All glory and honor and praise is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And all who agreed said together, Amen.